and um, I'm really happy to be able to talk with you all. Um, I have a great interest in this diatom and trying to unravel the essentially the mystery of why it has been spreading recently and what's changed in recent conditions as compared to the past. And I'm also glad to be here because I consider all of you folks the eyes and ears in the field. And I really want to um, invite you to um, contact me um, when you see uh, uh, invasive or if you see blooms of this diatom or are interested in having material confirmed. I try to keep track of it across the country. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you have questions, please chime in, and I will also um, leave some time that we can have a discussion. So um, from rare trophy to aquatic affliction, this diatom um, is native to North America. And I think that might be a question for a lot of you, and I will be talking about what that means. Um, it is invasive to New Zealand. We know that. It, it appeared in New Zealand in 2004. Um, we really consider that it is being spread by anglers. And I hope to distinguish between what I consider nuisance, nuisance blooms and invasiveness. Um, we've done some work to look at what are the controls on the geographic distribution. And the, and the occurrence of this diatom does have a lot to do with temperature and the base flow in rivers or streams. And I am also talk a little bit about what we know about where it has been in the past and how that may or may not be different than um, the present. We don't know um, about the, some of the genetics about this diatom, and that's one of the areas that we're looking at now to resolve if the reason that it's blooming now is that there's a, um, in a genetic variant that's responsible for these recent blooms. So I don't know how much all of you know about diatoms, um, but they are a kind of algae. And what's special about them is that they have a silica cell wall or frustule, um, this is composed of this inorganic silicon dioxide. It comes into two parts. This picture is an expanded view. At the top, there's a, um, one part of the valve, and then there's another valve at the bottom. These are put together like a Petri dish with a lot of girdle bands in between. So diatoms are different than other algae or other organisms because of these silica cell walls. And the genus Didymosphenia is really one of the diatoms that folks thought of as being uh, really a trophy. Um, the one on the right in blue, Gem Didymosphenia geminata, is found in the northern hemisphere and now in additional places. The other members of the genus are restricted into Lake Baikal in Siberia. There are, I have here, eight plus species. We think now there's probably more than 15. So it's really very interesting that the species uh, seems to have evolved in um, northern Russia. And there is only this one species that has become invasive to many places around the world. And just to remind you about diatoms as algae, um, they are um, uh, photosynthetic, and they are form the base of the food web. So other organisms depend on them. Here's an amoeba, and that cell that's, um, there's one here with two lines in it. This is a diatom right here. You can still see some of the chloroplasts those long things, and then um, and you can see their silica cell walls. I'm using my mouse. I don't know if anybody can see that, but I hope so. Um, and, and then to look at Didymosphenia geminata, it's much bigger than other diatoms. 
here it is um, that the scale bar in the upper left is about 50 microns. So this is well over 100 microns. And that's almost big enough to see. I can almost see it with the naked eye. Most other diatoms are not that big. This is really a, a, a dinosaur within the diatom world. And that kind of plays into how it is spreading, we think, and why it's so successful. It produces a stalk by the base of the cell. It secretes this stalk through from within the silica cell wall. And um, they're in, in the blue um, showing some of the detail of this stalk secretion. Uh, on the lower left is showing some of the stalk in a, in a stream that's been dried out. Many, maybe many of you have seen it when it looks like this. The stalk turns white, and most of what we see is the stalk. It's not actually the diatom. And then um, in the lower right is what this looks like when it's actively growing, kind of clumpy brown tufts. And those tufts are really the characteristic color of the cell of the chloroplast of diatoms. If we look at it in uh, an electron microscope, um, here are two cells that have just divided. So this species grows by vegetative cell division. A single cell divides and it forms two cells. And when it does that, it continues, they each of the cells continues to secrete stalk. So that sort of shriveled up thing at the base is the stalk. And then these two cells will continue to uh, produce more stalk. And then um, on top of this stalk is, are all these other little diatoms. You can see these little pieces of, of silica. And, and so one of the thing, ways that Didymosphenia changes its uh, stream environment is it produces a whole lot of new substrate, a new area surface area for other diatoms to grow. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later. And then here's um, a little bit lower magnification of the same image, the Didymosphenia cells over on the left, and then all the stalks. And then they've become colonized by all these other diatoms that are growing on top of those um, cells. So in effect, uh, Didymosphenia really produces an entire uh, new um, biofilm where uh, there, it supports a whole another set of uh, photosynthetic diatoms and the organisms that prey upon them. And here's a picture with uh, a macro lens. And you can probably just almost see the little specks those are the, are the Didymosphenia cells. There's a rock at the bottom. There's a whole lot of white stalk. And most of the cells are concentrated on the external surface of this tuft. And so these, these diatom growths can really grow on any kind of surface, whether it's a, a rock, um, like this one in Arkansas or on a metal structure in the Kootenai River in Montana. Um, it can grow in a lot of different places. Um, recently, um, there was a, a publication to document where uh, the occurrence of, of Didymosphenia. And um, so you can see it's primarily in the northern hemisphere. Not all of these records are confirmed. These are literature records. Um, let's see, the, the uh, triangles are the confirmed records. The, the dots are records that were a list in a, a publication. So you can see that it has quite a wide distribution over the northern hemisphere. Um, you can see it in, in New Zealand. There's a there's an odd point in Africa on the western side. And there's a couple of points in South America. And actually, um, last year, some large blooms were confirmed in Chile. And I thought that 
really for you folks that you're interested in um, New York and that region, um, how, you know, and I think one of the questions that comes up is, is this diatom invasive? And how is it, if it is, um, you know, how do we know that? And if it's not, how is, how is it different from the past? And these are some of the historical records. So we know that these were reported um, from many sites in, uh, in the Northeast, in New England, around the Great Lakes, from quite a long time ago. And these are simply reports. In some of the cases, we can see the actual slide, so we can confirm the record. Um, in other cases, it's simply a list. All of these are, are simply saying it's, this diatom is here. It wasn't until some of the later uh, publications, 1935 in China and in, uh, in France, that people started making comments about that there were either a lot of this diatom or there was something unusual about it. And it, it's, that's one of the, the mysteries to try to um, figure this out if there has been a change over time from was it just present to is it forming nuisance blooms. And we do see that as time goes on in all these sites from around the northern hemisphere that there are um, more people that note that uh, that this diatom is quite common. Um, and, and again, from the same paper that was actually uh, published in 2009, you can see that the citations is, is going up quite a bit um, and to now um, nearly 350 papers that have mentioned this diatom. But if we look at the uh, relative frequency of of it compared to all the diatom literature, it's, it's um, actually a little less than the past. So this really isn't a very good way for us to look at how um, this species has been present over time. We do know that it is invasive. In the South Island of New Zealand, it first appeared in the Mararoa River in the southern tip in 2004. In a very short time, it spread throughout New Zealand, and it's in well over 40 different watersheds at this point. It has not um, been found on the, the North Island. Um, oh, OK, it's 120 sites so in 40 different watersheds. And this is what it looks like in New Zealand, that brown color. And, it, and it's been really considered to be something of an environmental disaster there. And New Zealand um, has taken on a really pretty amazing um, uh, public relations campaign. And where they really, you know, something like 98% of the public knows about this invasive diatom. And they have very strict controls on um, decontamination of, of gear. And it's been very effective in getting people to know about the diatom. But one thing we don't know is, has it been effective at controlling the spread? In New Zealand, there's also a technique for detecting when it uh, comes into new watersheds. They developed a molecular-based detection. So a series of nets are put into a watershed and left there for a week. And then the DNA is uh, cloned and sequenced um, in order to check for the presence of this diatom. And this approach is currently being used in the North Island um, to uh, determine if there are new invasions there. The work in New Zealand was also very good in terms of uh, confirming that this uh, diatom can survive on felt sold waders and be spread. Um, and uh, Max Bothwell has done uh, published some work to show that in uh, British Columbia, 
the uh, advent of felt sold waders is concurrent with that spread in on Vancouver Island. We think that that has something to do with um, the prevalence of the thiatom. You know, easy to travel, adventure vacations. Um, this uh, if Didymosphenia is dark in the dark and cool and damp. Greater than 60 days, it can the cells uh, can remain viable. There's a, a pattern of um, nuisance blooms. We've seen these um, outbreaks happen across um, North America. These are just a few of the sites, and it's really a very similar pattern that uh, folks will report. Hey, we've never seen this before. There's um, there's this you know, terrible stuff that looks like sewage in the river. Um, and it's, it's really remarkable how these blooms appear and they're quite prevalent for a few years. Um, we, we don't know yet if they tend to decline after that time period or not. Um, there's some indication that that does happen in some parts of New Zealand. Anyway, um, we know that there's a relationship between the blooms um, and regulated rivers, so in um, impoundments and low flows. These are plots from the Kootenai River in Montana. It's nearly on the border of Canada. And um, somewhere around two th the year 2000, there was a big change in, in flow. And that change in 2000 was when uh, blooms of Didymosphenia became prevalent. This is one of the sites where I'm working right now, where there are still um, continued blooms, where we're looking at some of the, the, the roles of iron and phosphorus in the development of the blooms. What are the uh, ecosystem impacts of having a large amount of this diatom is that it really increases the, the amount of biomass. Each of these, um, these the, sh the short plots is prior to Didymosphenia, what the chlorophyll A, what the biomass was as measured by chlorophyll A, and then post Didymosphenia, um, nearly a uh, 20-fold increase in the amount of biomass in each of three sites. This was in Montana. And this is partly due, uh, due to the large cells themselves, and it's also due to the other diatoms that grow on the Didymosphenia stalks. One of the problems that we have in um, being able to determine whether there's a bloom going on or not is that the existing protocols are not adequate for assessing blooms. I, I, many of you are probably familiar with uh, EPA surveys. There's the, there was a National Lakes Assessment, National Stream and Rivers Assessment. There's now going to be a wetlands assessment. In the Western Stream Assessment, we uh, looked at 1,200 river sites, and one of the problems in, in using existing um, data from surveys is that it's not adequate to uh, determine the presence of this diatom. So here, what I'm showing is that um, in typically when we look at streams, say in the Western assessment, um, there's anywhere uh, on the on the left hand scale, valves on an entire slide. There might be one cell of Didymosphenia, or there might be nearly 500. But the the protocol showed that um, the protocol missed 50% of the occurrences, and it has to do with this um, method of of using a standard protocol because Didymosphenia is a very large cell and, this, and the counts are based on um, mostly very small cells. 
we determined that somewhere around 8% of the sites in the Western EMAP survey, that was between 2000 and 2004, have this diatom present. In the Colorado mountains, it's probably about 20% of the sites. Um, we know a little bit about what the physical parameters are where it is, occurs, but because of the previous slide, we don't know very much about how its total abundance relates to these um, physical and chemical parameters. So we can say in terms of where it's present, it's most often present in low nitrate conditions, most often present in low phosphorus. Temperature, it has a quite a broad range. That scale is from 4 degrees C to over 25 degrees C. That temperature does not seem to be a strong variable for this diatom. It's mostly in low silica concentrations and primarily in pHs above 5 and of a lower um, acid neutralizing capacity, or if you want to think about alkalinity. We know that um, this diatom changes the, uh, the other species that are present. This is from work in New Zealand that showed um, before Didymosphenia, there was a very broad diversity of species that were present. These would be different diatom species. Once there was a bloom, the uh, diversity was uh, markedly decreased. It, so it, it really fundamentally changes the stream. Um, we looked at uh, the distribution across the U.S. Um, where uh, Didymo is reported present is the red X's in the top graph. The, the uh, black ones are the, uh, where it was absent, where we, uh, there were studies but it wasn't detected. And then the, the blue sites were ones that we used in a model, the absent sites that we used to be able to uh, predict the probability of presence based on a range of um, climatic and watershed characters across the U.S. So this lower plot shows our prediction based just on climate and um, uh, watershed variables about where we expect Didymosphenia can grow. Um, in that model, which is the Maxent model, um, we found that the mean temperature, this is air temperature, was really important to its growth. The base flow, the growing degree days, which is basically the certain number of days above a certain temperature, and elevation are all strong in controlling where it grows. And then, so this is kind of the, if you think about this as being the, uh, the, the physical habitat um, that this diatom can be, um, then we know that people can introduce it um, and it may be able to grow in, in these sites. We also know um, that in some places, um, I, you know, I hinted at previously that they are, um, that we've known that it's present for a long time in uh, many places across the U.S. We also um, are doing a series of studies to look at the historical distribution. Now this is uh, from a lake in Alaska where this is kind of its typical habitat. We know Didymosphenia grows here very well, but one of the surprising um, um, aspects of this site was in looking at a sediment core from the lake. Um, over on the left-hand scale, we have calendar year, so the year 2000, and we went back 800 years to the year 1200, and the second plot over, um, there's actually two species of Didymosphenia present here. It has been present for over 800 years, and it really has not changed in its abundance. 
So we know in some places it's not something new. In Alaska, this is not something new. And what um, I'm working on with collaborators is to look at the historical, the changes in abundance in other sites. We know, too, that um, we're, we are trying to connect this to the, the genetic differences. We compared the Alaska sites with um, sites around, um, around the, the Nor North America and also New Zealand. We looked at uh, Wyoming, New Zealand, Colorado, and Quebec. And we can actually characterize the different populations by their shape features. And we hope that this will be also uh, linked to their molecular sequences so that we can not only uh, join how populations are related now, but how they were in the past and how that relates to their spread. I think that it's really important to continue to implement public education programs uh, to decontaminate uh, gear. Um, it's quite clear that this diatom survives on um, felt sold waders, and there are many states now that are implementing a ban now that there are other types of waders that are available for recreation. Um, we have implemented a global population study to be able to look at molecular markers. Um, unlike other organisms, the diatoms are not really all that well known, and we've been really rudimentary at being able to just find a, a, a sequence of the genome that's useful in um, identifying different populations. We haven't been able to do that yet. So one of the things we don't know is if this is if the populations in North America represent an invasive strain. It's not known. Um, it, one of the um, reasons is if you folks can be part of the eyes and ears, we can work to map the spatial and temporal distribution of nuisance blooms. I maintain a, uh, a database of the sites Beautiful. where it's reported, and also uh, along with um, voucher specimens. It's very important to have voucher specimens. Um, we know that in the past there have been many misidentifications and that um, it's not reliable to actually go on just reports without having a um, a, a specimen to back that up. We hope that this will help um, to to document you know, how how is it spreading. And I thought I'll end there and open it up. I'm um, many of you may have questions, so I'd like to um, open up the conversation. And please contact me if there are any.